Section 26 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Madame Bo Peep of the Ranches, Part 2. Two rooms at the east end of the house had been arranged for the occupancy of the ranch's mistress. When she entered them, a slight dismay seized her at their bare appearance and the scantiness of their furniture, but she quickly reflected that the climate was a semi-tropical one and was moved to appreciation of the well-conceived efforts to conform to it. The sashes had already been removed from the big windows, and white curtains waved in the gulf breeze that streamed through the wide jalousies. The bare floor was amply strewn with cool rugs. The chairs were inviting, deep, dreamy willows. The walls were papered with a light, cheerful olive. One whole side of her sitting room was covered with books on smooth, unpainted pine shelves. She flew to these at once. Before her was a well-selected library. She caught glimpses of titles of volumes of fiction and travel not yet seasoned from the dampness of the press. Presently, recollecting that she was now in a wilderness given over to mutton, centipedes, and privations, the incongruity of these luxuries struck her and, with intuitive feminine suspicion, she began turning to the fly-leaves of volume after volume. Upon each was inscribed in fluent characters the name of Theodore Westlake, Jr. Octavia, fatigued by her long journey, retired early that night. Lying upon her white, cool bed, she rested deliciously, but sleep coquetted long with her. She listened to faint noises whose strangeness kept her faculties on the alert the fractious yelping of the coyotes, the ceaseless, low symphony of the wind, the distant booming of the frogs about the lake, the lamentation of the concertina in the Mexicans' quarters. There were many conflicting feelings in her heart, thankfulness and rebellion, peace and disquietude, loneliness and a sense of protecting care, happiness and an old, haunting pain. She did what any other woman would have done, sought relief in a wholesome tide of unreasonable tears, and her last words, murmured to herself before slumber, capitulating, came softly to woo her, were, He has forgotten. The manager of the Rancho de las Sombras was no dilettante. He was a hustler. He was generally up, mounted, and away on mornings before the rest of the household were awake, making the rounds of the flocks and camps. This was the duty of the major-domo, a stately old Mexican with a princely air and manner. But Teddy seemed to have a great deal of confidence in his own eyesight. Except in the busy season, he nearly always returned to the ranch to breakfast at eight o'clock, with Octavia and Mrs. McIntyre, at the little table set in the central hallway, bringing with him a tonic and breezy cheerfulness full of the health and flavor of the prairies. A few days after Octavia's arrival, he made her get out one of her riding skirts and curtail it to a shortness demanded by the chaparral brakes. With some misgiving, she donned this and a pair of buckskin leggings, he prescribed in addition, and mounted upon a dancing pony, rode with him to view her possessions. He showed her everything, the flocks of ewes, muttons, and grazing lambs, the dipping vats, the shearing pens, the uncouth merino rams in their little pasture, the water tanks prepared against a summer drought, giving account of his stewardship with a boyish enthusiasm that never flagged. Where was the old Teddy that she knew so well? This side of him was the same. It was a side that pleased her, but this was all she ever saw of him now. Where was his sentimentality, those old, varying moods of impetuous love-making, of fanciful, quixotic devotion, of heartbreaking gloom, of alternating absurd tenderness and haughty dignity. His nature had been a sensitive one, his temperament bordering closely on the artistic. She knew that, besides being a follower of fashion and its fads and sports, he had cultivated tastes of a finer nature. He had written things, he had tampered with colors. He was something of a student in certain branches of art. And once she had been admitted to all his aspirations and thoughts, but now, and she could not avoid the conclusion 
Teddy had barricaded against her every side of himself except one, the side that showed the management of the Rancho de las Sombras, and a jolly chum who had forgiven and forgotten. Queerly enough, the words of Mr. Bannister's description of her property came into her mind, all enclosed within a strong, barbed wire fence. Teddy's fence, too, said Octavia to herself. It was not difficult for her to reason out the cause of his fortifications. It had originated one night at the Hammersmith's ball. It occurred at a time soon after she had decided to accept Colonel Beaupre and his millions, which was no more than her looks and the entree she held in the inner circles were worth. Teddy had proposed with all his impetuosity and fire, and she looked him straight in the eye and said, coldly and finally, Never let me hear any such silly nonsense from you again. You won't, said Teddy, with an expression around his mouth. And now Teddy was enclosed within a strong barbed wire fence. It was on this first ride of inspection that Teddy was seized by the inspiration that suggested the name of Mother Goose's heroine, and he at once bestowed it upon Octavia. The idea, supported by both a similarity of names and identity of occupations, seemed to strike him as a peculiarly happy one, and he never tired of using it. The Mexicans on the ranch also took up the name, adding another syllable to accommodate their lingual incapacity for the final P, gravely referring to her as La Madama Bopipi. Eventually it spread, and Madame Bopip's ranch was as often mentioned as the Rancho de las Sombras. Came the long hot season from May to September, when work is scarce on the ranches. Octavia passed the days in a kind of lotus eater's dream. Books, hammocks, correspondence with a few intimate friends, a renewed interest in her old watercolor box and easel. These disposed of the sultry hours of daylight. The evenings were always sure to bring enjoyment. Best of all were the rapturous horseback rides with Teddy, when the moon gave light over the windswept leagues, chaperoned by the wheeling nighthawk and the startled owl. Often the Mexicans would come up from their shacks with their guitars and sing the weirdest of heartbreaking songs. They were long, cozy chats on the breezy gallery and an interminable warfare of wits between Teddy and Mrs. McIntyre, whose abundant Scotch shrewdness often more than overmatched the lighter humor in which she was lacking. And the nights came one after another and were filed away by weeks and months, nights soft and languorous and fragrant that should have driven Stefan to Chloe over wires however barbed that might have drawn Cupid himself to hunt, lasso in hand, among those amorous pastures, but Teddy kept his fences up. One July night, Madame Bo Peep and her ranch manager were sitting on the East Gallery. Teddy had been exhausting the science of prognostication as to the probabilities of a price of twenty-four cents for the autumn clip, and had then subsided into an anesthetic cloud of Havana smoke. Only as incompetent a judge as a woman would have failed to note long ago that at least a third of his salary must have gone up in the fumes of those imported regalias. Teddy, said Octavia, suddenly and rather sharply, why are you working down here on a ranch for? One hundred per, said Teddy glibly, and found. I've a good mind to discharge you. Can't do it, said Teddy with a grin. Why not, demanded Octavia, with argumentative heat. Under contract, terms of sale respect all unexpired contracts. Mine runs until 12 p.m., December 31st. You might get up at midnight on that date and fire me. If you try sooner, I'll be in a position to bring legal proceedings. Octavia seemed to be considering the prospect of litigation. But, continued Teddy cheerfully, I've been thinking of resigning anyway. Octavia's rocking chair ceased its motion. There were centipedes in this country, she felt sure, and Indians, and vast, lonely, desolate, empty wastes, all within strong barbed wire fence. There was a Van Dresser pride, but there was also a Van Dresser heart. She must know for certain whether or not he had forgotten. Ah, oh, well, Teddy, she said, with a fine assumption of polite interest. It's lonely down here. You're longing to get back, 
to the old life, to polo, and lobsters, and theaters, and balls. Never cared much for balls, said Teddy virtuously. You're getting old, Teddy. Your memory is failing. Nobody ever knew you to miss a dance unless it occurred on the same night with another one which you attended. And you showed such shocking bad taste, too, in dancing too often with the same partner. Let me see. What was that Forbes girl's name? The one with the wall eyes? Mabel, wasn't it? No, Adelaide. Mabel was the one with the bony elbows. That wasn't wall in Adelaide's eyes. It was soul. We used to talk sonnets together. And Verlaine. Just then I was trying to run a pipe from the Perrying Spring. You were on the floor with her, said Octavia, undeflected, five times at the Hammersmiths. Hammersmiths what? questioned Teddy, vacuously. Ball, ball, said Octavia, viciously. What were we talking of? Eyes, I thought, said Teddy, after some reflection, and elbows. Those Hammersmiths, went on Octavia, in her sweetest society prattle, after subduing an intense desire to yank a handful of sunburnt, sandy hair from the head lying back contentedly against the canvas of the steamer chair, had too much money. Mines, wasn't it? It was something that paid something to the tongue. You couldn't get a glass of plain water in their house. Everything at that ball was dreadfully overdone. It was, said Teddy. Such a crowd there was, Octavia continued, conscious that she was talking the rapid drivel of a schoolgirl describing her first dance. The balconies were as warm as the rooms. I lost something at that ball. The last sentence was uttered in a tone calculated to remove the barbs from miles of wire. So did I, confessed Teddy in a lower voice. A glove, said Octavia, falling back as the enemy approached her ditches. Cast, said Teddy, halting his firing line without loss. I hobnobbed, half the evening, with one of the Hammersmith's miners, a fellow who kept his hands in his pockets and talked like an archangel about reduction plants and drifts and levels and sluice boxes. A pearl-gray glove, nearly new, sighed Octavia mournfully. A bang-up chap, that McArdle, maintained Teddy approvingly, a man who hated olives and elevators, a man who handled mountains as croquets and built tunnels in the air, a man who never uttered a word of silly nonsense in his life. Did you sign those lease renewals applications yet, madama? They've got to be on file in the land office by the 31st. Teddy turned his head lazily. Octavia's chair was vacant. A certain centipede, crawling along the lines marked out by fate, expounded the situation. It was early one morning, while Octavia and Mrs. McIntyre were trimming the honeysuckle on the west gallery. Teddy had risen and departed hastily before daylight in response to word that a flock of ewes had been scattered from their bedding ground during the night by a thunderstorm. The centipede, driven by destiny, showed himself on the floor of the gallery, and then, the screeches of the two women giving him his cue, he scuttled with all his yellow legs through the open door into the furthermost west room, which was Teddy's. Arming themselves with domestic utensils selected with regard to their length, Octavia and Mrs. McIntyre, with much clutching of skirts and skirmishing for a position of rear guard in the attacking force, followed. Once outside, the centipede seemed to have disappeared, and his prospective murderers began a thorough but cautious search for their victim. Even in the midst of such a dangerous and absorbing adventure, Octavia was conscious of an awed curiosity on finding herself in Teddy's sanctum. In that room he sat alone, silently, communing with those secret thoughts that he now shared with no one, dreamed there, whatever dreams he now called on, no one to interpret. It was a room of a Spartan or a soldier. In one corner stood a wide canvas-covered cot. In another, a small bookcase. In another, a grim stand of Winchesters and shotguns. An immense table, strewn with letters, papers, and documents, surmounted by a set of pigeonholes, occupied one side. The centipede showed genius in concealing himself in such bare quarters. Mrs. McIntyre, was poking a broom handle behind the bookcase. Octavia approached Teddy's cot. The room was just as the manager had left it, in his hurry. 
The Mexican maid had not yet given it her attention. There was his big pillow, with the imprint of his head still in the center. She thought the horrid beast might have climbed the cot and hidden itself to bite Teddy. Centipedes were thus cruel and vindictive toward managers. She cautiously overturned the pillow, and then parted her lips to give the signal for reinforcements at the sight of a long, slender, dark object lying there. But repressing it in time, she caught up a glove, a pearl-gray glove flattened, it might be conceived, by many, many months of nightly pressure beneath the pillow of the man who had forgotten the Hammersmith's ball. Teddy must have left so hurriedly that morning that he had, for once, forgotten to transfer it to its resting place by day. Even managers, who are notoriously wily and cunning, are sometimes caught up with. Octavia slid the gray glove into the bosom of her summery morning gown. It was hers. Men who had put themselves within strong barbed-wired fence and remembered Hammersmith's balls only by the talk of miners about sluice boxes should not be allowed to possess such articles. After all, what a paradise this prairie country was, how it blossomed like the rose when you found things that were thought to be lost. How delicious was that morning breeze coming in the windows, fresh and sweet with the breath of the yellow Ratama blooms. Might one not stand for a minute with shining far-gazing eyes and dream that mistakes might be corrected? Why was Mrs. McIntyre poking about so absurdly with a broom? I found it, said Mrs. McIntyre, banging the door. Here it is. Did you lose something? asked Octavia, with sweetly polite non-interest. The little devil, said Mrs. McIntyre, driven to violence. You've not forgotten him already. Between them they slew the centipede. Thus he was rewarded for his agency toward the recovery of things lost at the Hammersmith's ball. It seems that Teddy, in due course, remembered the glove, and when he returned to the house at sunset, made a secret but exhaustive search for it. Not until evening, upon the moonlit eastern gallery, did he find it. It was upon the hand that he had thought lost to him forever, and so he was moved to repeat certain nonsense that he had been commanded never, never to utter again. Teddy's fences were down. This time there was no ambition to stand in the way, and the wooing was as natural and successful as it should be between ardent shepherd and gentle shepherdess. The prairies changed to a garden. The Rancho de las Sombras became the Ranch of Light. A few days later, Octavia received a letter from Mr. Bannister, in reply to one she had written to him, asking some questions about her business. A portion of the letter ran as follows. I am at a loss to account for your reference to the sheep ranch. Two months after your departure, to take up your residence upon it, it was discovered that Colonel Beaupre's title was worthless. A deed came to light, showing that he had disposed of the property before his death. The matter was reported to your manager, Mr. Westlake, who had once repurchased the property. It is entirely beyond my power of conjecture to imagine how you have remained in ignorance of this fact. I beg that you will at once confer with that gentleman, who will at least corroborate my statement. Octavia sought Teddy with battle in her eyes. What are you working on this ranch for? she asked once more. One hundred, he began to repeat but saw in her face that she knew. She held up Mr. Bannister's letter in her hand. He knew that the game was up. It's my ranch, said Teddy, like a schoolboy detected in evil. It's a mighty poor manager that isn't able to absorb the boss's business if you give him time. Why were you working down here? pursued Octavia, still struggling after the key to the riddle of Teddy. To tell the truth, Tave, said Teddy, with quiet candor, it wasn't for the salary. That about kept me in cigars and sunburn lotions. I was sent south by my doctor. Twas the right lung that was going to the bad, on account of over-exercise and strain at polo and gymnastics. I needed climate and ozone and rest, and things of that sort. In an instant Octavia was close against the vicinity of the affected organ. Mr. Bannister's letter fluttered to the floor. It's, it's well now, isn't it, Teddy? Sound as a mesquite chunk. I deceived you in one thing. I paid fifty thousand for your ranch as soon as I found you had no title. 
I had just about that much income accumulated at my banker's while I've been herding sheep down here. So it was almost like picking the thing up on a bargain counter for a penny. There's another little surplus of unearned increment piling up there. Tave, I've been thinking of a wedding trip in a yacht with white ribbons tied to the mast through the Mediterranean and then up among the Hebrides and down Norway to the Zyder Zee. And I was thinking, said Octavia softly, of a wedding gallop with my manager among the flocks of sheep and back to a wedding breakfast with Mrs. McIntyre on the gallery with maybe a sprig of orange blossom fastened to the red jar above the table. Teddy laughed and began to chant, Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Let him alone, they'll come home, and... Octavia drew his head down and whispered in his ear, But that is one of the tales they brought behind them. End of Madame Bo Peep of the Ranches Part 2 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas End of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry